Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Shopify Masterclass on Quick Wins and Tips for a Successful Ecom Brand, How to Find and Keep Customers. My name is Josh Briscoe of Tenuity. I'm the VP of Growth Media there, and uh, I've been here for the last nine years, really fully immersed in uh, all things paid media for small and mid-sized businesses, and Tenuity is the largest independent agency across the triopoly of Google, Facebook, and Amazon. Um, so super excited to, to speak to you all today about this topic. I know that um, how to be successful as an e-com brand is it's something I have 15 minutes here with you today, plus or minus. Uh, but this is something that you could talk on for 15 hours, maybe even an entire uh, you know, college semester about. So really hoping to, to hone in on just a few core topics that are really kind of near and dear to me, and I think will, will be helpful to you as well. So let's kick things off. And number one, what we're going to cover today, defining your brand identity. Uh, acquiring customers, which is kind of my favorite part uh, in, in being in the paid media side of things, and also retaining your customers, which is uh, one of kind of really one of the unsung heroes of, of the su successful uh, e-commerce brands and why this is such an important focus and needs to be an important focus for you. Uh, so first of all, getting into defining your branded ad brand identity. Um, I know this kind of seems might seem like a no brainer for people, but um, it's something that changed and evolves over time, but it really is super important to uh, making sure that you're putting your best foot out there and making sure that your brand is actually conveying itself as it wants to be uh, to your customer base. So I'm going to walk through a few kind of key components here. Um, and number one, yeah, I feel like uh, sometimes we we hit brands that are hitting inflection points and really wondering who am I, you know, what direction am I going to take? What 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 message do I want to convey to my to my customers? And so here are a few different ways that we can uh, hopefully set to define some of these boundaries and define who you are as a brand to really take you to the next level and help take you to the next level. Uh, number one is just going to be defining your core values. And um, I, I say this, and this again, seems kind of uh, simplistic elementary, but uh, in this day and age, um, it's a crowded space out there. There's there's a lot of brands. Chances are you're not in a vertical where you're the only one selling your type of product. And so you really need to differentiate yourself in, in many ways. And a lot of these next um, kind of core values or these next aspects that I'm going to talk about uh, intertwine with each other. But um, you need to be able to tell your your story to to, sell, to set yourself apart here. People are more and more buying from, from brands that... Uh, the value stories resonate with them personally. And so conveying that value message, uh, conveying who you are as a brand, what your DNA is, what you stand for, um, is really going to bring customers closer to you and really help define uh, your user base. Alongside that is, is defining your value prop. So why should people purchase you uh, as opposed to your competitors? And But if you're you know the highest price point amongst your competitors, why should people be willing to pay more from you? If you're the lowest uh, you know price, why should... Why should people believe in the quality of your product? So really conveying your value prop, establishing it, number one, but then conveying it in every channel that you possibly can um, is going to do you some, some great benefit. Alongside, of course, your brand voice, and this really ties into the top two, um, your core values and your value prop, um, but how you speak with your customers. It, it's one thing to have these core values. It's one thing to have this value proposition, but you need to be able to speak that language to your customers in a way, again, that resonates with them, that's going to make them feel close to you as a brand, and eventually is going to make them get in your conversion funnel, actually purchase from you, and then ideally repurchase from you. A pricing strategy, are you the low cost option? Are you the premium option? Are you somewhere in between? None of these things are need to be set in stone. They can be fluid, but we do see brands start to struggle when they, they don't really identify where they are from a pricing perspective. And, and tying in pretty closely with the pricing strategy is a promotional strategy too. And uh, are you the everyday low price type? Are you everyday premium price? Are you heavy on promotions? Do you do occasional promotions, et cetera? And, and these are really ways that you need to define yourself as a brand, just ways to to set yourself apart as a brand, really know who you are. And then from there, you can really define your marketing strategy and everything starts to roll downhill from there. Just having a great product that sells um, does not make a brand. And so a brand truly embodies all of these components and more, but these are kind of the top five that stand out to me as exceedingly important. So your brand has been identified, or at least you're redefining who you are, you're figuring out who you are. Now it's time to get out there and acquire customers. And anytime we're embarking on any type of campaign, campaign, you need to know what your goals are. And so obviously this is a very kind of a two coin sided way of looking things, but on, on one side of spectrum, there's your efficiency focused uh, brand. And the other side, there's your growth focused brand and um, how they approach uh, everything from customer acquisition to retention is really going to vary based upon which side of the spectrum 
uh, a brand is, is focused on. And so if you are more on the efficiency focused side of or, or phase of your business or uh, maturity of your business, things like ROI, ROAS, CPA are going to be your primary KPIs as you probably are constrained maybe by cash flow or you're just really trying to stay lean as a business. Um, so you're really looking for to maximize um, your return on ad spend and, and your return on investment across kind of everything that you're putting into your business. And this is not to say that um, you know you don't have money to spend or you're not trying to grow as well because everybody wants to grow and uh, and grow as efficiently as possible. But um, these two things don't always play so nicely together. And so having an understanding of what your key goal is, um, again, helps inform everything else that you're going to be doing. And on the flip side of that coin, uh, the growth-focused advertiser, the growth-focused brand is going to be focused on new customer acquisition. Uh, oftentimes, that's that's talked about as CAC, um, top-line revenue, year-on-year -year growth. These are things that you're really going to be evaluating and measuring the success of your brand, aggressively acquire new customers, and 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 really kind of hyper uh, hyper drive your top line. We all, we always see and, and talk about media and marketing as a funnel, and so even before we get into that, I'm going to talk a lot. About more about this later on in the presentation, but I love this concept of flipping the funnel um, and really putting this uh, this primary focus on loyalty because in the traditional marketing funnel, you, you always see loyalty and re-engagement down there at the bottom. Even in this picture, it's a little smallest kind of a uh, little oval there, um, but it's exceedingly important that you start with loyalty. Everybody knows, it, but it's easy to forget. Uh, it's much cheaper to retain a customer, to keep somebody within your funnel than it is to acquire a net new customer. Uh, but the thing is to do that, you have to do, you have to be strategic and you also have to have a certain degree of uh, first party data infrastructure set up and the cement that holds uh, the loyalty aspect and the retention aspect together is first party data. And in the past, we were able to get away with this with a lot of usage of cookies, but as we all know, the cookie is, is going away here sooner than later. It definitely has a, an expiration date on it. Um, and so getting your first party data infrastructure in place is absolutely crucial, even before we want to get into this uh, breaking down a little bit more what actual media mixes can look like from a customer acquisition perspective. I have to throw this out there and we have to just focus on this aspect of flipping the funnel, placing loyalty up there at the top. Now, if we're talking about, uh, you know, funnel focus, here we are more tra traditional funnel, the return driven advertiser over here on the left hand side is really going to be focused more on this bottom of the funnel or consideration, conversion, loyalty. Again, you're focused on things like ROI, CPA, you are return driven. And so you want to focus on that bottom of the funnel. Um, you don't want to necessarily exclude your brand awareness side of things, but getting people when they're ready to buy where they're ready to buy is your primary concern. You're probably not doing too much brand building from a you know, paid media perspective. Um, and so you're gonna invest more heavily in that bottom funnel. Whereas the growth uh, driven advertiser is really gonna span across the entire funnel. They probably skew at least more from a, uh, a media dollars spend perspective towards the top of the funnel. But again, I, I'd be remiss if I left loyalty out of here. And so the growth driven advertiser is really gonna be focused across the entire funnel with a particular emphasis on the top phase where that where that, that brand awareness phase is at. We're gonna look here at the return driven advertiser and these are just some common like baselines and, and really just basics for what we would recommend in terms of a, a media mix or a channel mix for an advertiser based upon what their goals are. But if you are revenue driven and return driven, you know the majority or at least 50% of the spend is, is on bottom funnel tactics search and shopping here occupying 25 and 25% each. Um, social here still plays a very large component. The thing about social is it's so versatile and where you can target things um, in terms of uh, funnel placement. You can go, you can put all of your, your social dollars towards bottom of the funnel tactics. Conversely, you can go all the way to the top. So this social bucket here is really going to be focused more towards the bottom of the funnel. You're retargeting, uh, your product ads, your, and really getting people to return. We're, we're not brand building on this side of things. Whereas your growth advertiser, and you'll see search and shopping here looking a lot smaller as a, as a piece of the marketing pie, though they definitely still are. We do have to capture demand that we're generating. Absolutely. Cannot forget that. Um, you'll see social with a, a much larger slice of the pie here, video and OTT actually taking a bigger piece of the pie here with display also uh, always being present within a marketing mix. And this social 40% that you're seeing here is a rough baseline. This is probably going to be more spent on your mid and upper, upper funnel social channels and uh, ad units within those channels. And if we break down where you can spend money across these different social channels, um, you know, I, I hear a lot of the times that people will kind of relegate a certain channel to a, a certain part of the funnel. And I, I really want to dispel that myth. And it's been really nice to see over the years that basically every single social channel has an offering for every part of the funnel. So it's, it's no longer kind of a, uh, 
something that you can back out of saying, oh, I don't want to test in this channel because it's only top of funnel, or this is really just bottom of funnel. I don't want to test into here. Every single channel has a, you know, an awareness, a consideration, intent, and even a, um, a retention aspect to it. And so there's really no excuse not to be investing, obviously, strategically and in line with your goals across as many of these social channels that you are, because this is what you hear. All of these channels, they're, they're household names because this is where people spend their time. And it's not just one particular demographic, age group, um, anything like that that's spending times on these channels. It's, it's across the board. And there are ways to be successful on every single one of these channels. So again, going back to who you are as a brand and that brand voice is, is going to inform how you speak to your customers on these channels and how you target your customers on these channels. Um, but you can absolutely find success, whether you are super ROAS driven, whether you are, you do need a strict return. Now, moving forward, the same applies to the Google Microsoft approach too. Um, these channels have, have always had great kind of funnel coverage across awareness, consideration, and action, um, whether that be YouTube, Discovery Ads, GDN, GDA, uh, Microsoft Ads Network. Depending on where you are as an advertiser, what your goals are, what your brand voice is, there really is a way to diversify your media mix in a way that's going to make sense for you and it's going to maximize uh, your ability to convert to not only attract, but also convert and retain customers. While we're talking about Shopify and we're here today because of Shopify, um, Shopify is a really nice platform to work through because there's so many just out of the box native integrations with these same marketing channels that we just covered on the product listing side. So this would just be sending your product data feed out to these channels and getting product listings out. The Google Merchant Center, Facebook and Instagram, Snapchat, eBay, all just plug and play connectors. Um, you're, you're up and running within a few clicks, which is amazing. And I, I definitely do recommend as you become a little bit more advanced and you are expanding into other marketing channels, but Shopify is, is great in getting people off the ground very simply and very cost effectively in that sense. And then the same thing with shops and shoppable media, which is you know huge in our industry right now. It's only growing. We see a lot of success over in Asia in this space. And uh, the year-over-year -year in, uh, increases here in the U.S. are also very strong in North America. Um, but again, out-of-the-box connectors for these, Facebook and Instagram shops, Snapchat, TikTok, Walmart Marketplace, um, Shopify makes it really, really easy to get into these marketing channels. There are free options here within everything that I list here. And these are kind of, in my mind, these are table stakes in terms of uh, we're talking about brand building here today and, and, and customer acquisition. And so... There's really no excuse not to, because it's, if you're on Shopify, these are once again, out of the box connectors. There's ways to get these up and running at no cost to you. Extremely important that you get these set up. This is probably my favorite part. I know I, I touched on it a little bit before, but um, customer retention is, it's not as sexy as customer acquisition. It's its not as fun. It's uh, its not as fun to look at as you're on your P&L and your, your weekly dashboards and all of that. But we often get asked the question, oh, like, when should I start my, um, you know, customer retention strategy? And the best answer is the day that your website went live. But the second best answer is today. You're never too small to, to put emphasis and effort into your customer retention strategies. You never, you know, have too few customers to do this. Even if you don't have a ton of first party data, there's no better time to start than now. And again, I come back to this, this focus of flipping the funnel, um, starting with this customer first data infrastructure up here at the top, um, starting with that loyalty focus. And then as you know, we, we covered some of the medium X aspects of things, um, really using that to fuel this customer first data acquisition strategy. You're getting all these people to your website and you need to have the systems in place to capture them. We used to be able to rely on, on cookies very well for our marketing, for our retention, all of that. And as we know, cookies in general have, have lost a lot of the efficacy that they've had in, in past years. Um, and they're going away here uh, very, very soon. And so we need to start planning for that. We need to get these infrastructures in place and it needs to be done now. And just walking through a few like real high level steps to, to making sure that you're getting this done um, and the basics of uh, customer first data infrastructure. Um, number one is the acquisition phase, probably a little bit more of a, of a no brainer. You're gathering your emails, your phone numbers, but things that, that don't often, I think, get associated with, with first party data are reviews, UGC, other self-reported data that customers will give brands. It's exceedingly important to capture all this um, number one, that you're capturing it, but ensuring that it's, it's also going to the right place and it's usable to you, which speaks to this, this next point of hygiene. Um, we're getting data from so many disparate sources. Again, even if you look at what I listed here, email, phone numbers, reviews, you just see these are probably all coming from different third-party vendors, different sources, people that are different phases of the buying process. And so being able to unify this data, or at least put it into a same place where it is going to be usable in these next couple of steps I'm going to talk about 
is super important. And this, this phase is one of the ones that's definitely easier said than done, but when done right, makes that first party data that you've collected super powerful and, and super actionable. Uh, the next phase being analysis, and that's really taking that data that you have, being able to segment it, being able to actually use it within the channels that um, that you're working on and that you're advertising and marketing through things like ESPs, your CRM, your CDP. These are all tools and platforms that are going to help you analyze this data within the preparation to then activate this data here in the last step, which is actually harvesting this data and harnessing it and getting out into your marketing channels. So whether that be email, whether that be exporting these email lists to the various channels that you are, whether it be Google, Facebook, Snap, basically anywhere, um, using those lists either directly as, as targeting pools or using them as seeds for lookalike audiences, uh, running your own LTV analysis. All of this is exceedingly important and all of it's dependent on these first three steps getting done. So again, uh, the first party data collection, um, not only the collection, but the entire infrastructure to make sure that you're able to collect it clean it up, analyze it, and then activate it is exceedingly important. And you need all this stuff set up to make sure that you're retaining your customers. We covered a lot of this, but I just wanted to, to show this slide and that there's there's so many different ways that you can capture this first party data. Just can't stress enough the importance of making sure that your, your infrastructure is in place, it's collecting, and, and you're able to use this. And um, I, I like this slide because it does call out a lot of uh, you know potential first party data uh, sources that we don't necessarily always think of, but again, reviews, forums, personalization on site is a great way to actually use this data. Customer service, uh, there's a lot of vendors that have really transformed customer service into a, a cost center to a revenue center. Surveys, things like that, referrals, loyalty programs. There's so many different ways to to gather this, this first party data and then to use it. Um, it again, cannot stress it enough to get this infrastructure in place um, sooner than later and, and really make it work for you. So key takeaways, appreciate everybody's time. Um, I'm almost out of here. Uh, but finding your brand identity, again, seems like a no brainer, but really taking a step back, looking in the mirror, figuring out who you are, who you wanna be, is exceedingly important as it's going to inform the rest of what you're gonna be doing here. Um, acquiring customers using varied tactics based on your business goals. We went over a lot of the paid tactics here today, how they work, how you can craft your, your channel mix strategy, depending on if you're in a growth phase or more of a, an ROI and a return-based phase, efficiency phase. And finally, investing in a first-party data infrastructure and loyalty and retention uh, initiatives early. Um, you cannot do this early enough, uh, in my opinion. There's never It's never too early to start this. Um, but also as a caveat here, making sure that everything is set up, it's working properly and helping you retain customers. So I appreciate everybody's time today. Again, my name is Josh Briscoe here as part of the Shopify Masterclass. I hope you learned a thing or two. Thank you very much, everybody.